today we got to play... Arborea. So this game is definitely a track game yeah. going up multiple different tracks. But before we get into it, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. Because board games are amazing. And that's what we do here at Legends of Nirvana. Now, Randy, can you tell us a little bit more about this game? Now, I can. A is, little it, bit. is it done by the person who does Bitoku? No, it isn't. It just has that vibe of Bitoku. It does. It definitely does. So, uh, unfortunately, Board Game Geek's website is down right now, so I can't get the stats as far as what their rank and rating are. But it's a one to five player game. Uh, presumably, it was released in 2023 because we have a copy that came from them, but it was late 2023. Age 14 and up. 90 to 120 minutes in length, uh, designed by Danny Garcia, art by uh, Nico Gendron, and Javier Ink Gollum, published by Alley Cat Games. Now, the this is the deluxe version. The main re difference between the deluxe and the standard version that is that it has a too many expansions and a bunch more wooden pieces. That These are all screen printed, which we'll get to in a little bit. The... MSRP for the retail edition is $54.99, but it's on pre-order right now. The deluxe version is available on Alley Cat's website. It has £57.99, pounds, which translates to roughly $73.75 US dollars. So you can still pick up this deluxe, but you're going to be paying a premium from what the Kickstarter was. Game Nerds has the retail version, uh, the cheapest, on pre-order for $38.47, uh, followed by Miniature Market at $39.99. Mm -hmm. And that's all I got. Okay. Um, all right. So let's talk about quality opponents. So you do get a lot of wooden bits with the screen printing on them. Um, all of them do. So that makes them really cool. Um, and then... That's pretty much it. You've got, you know, your normal board. Yeah. You've got some cardboard got sliding. Got cards that do have a linen finish. Yes, they do have a linen finish. Um, and um, other than that... There's a lot of construct constructible oh, that's true. storage. These hold together pretty well, although if you pick it up by the ends, you got to be careful because these will slide out. But the rest of it is pretty well stable. Well, and the fact that they've done it like in the colors that it's supposed to go yeah. in and stuff. That's and they have pictures cool. of the characters so you can yeah. match them up easily, even if with color blindness issues. Yeah. So, um, I, I think it's fine. I think it's good. Um, nothing breathtaking or anything, but all pretty decent. I'm probably going to give this a seven, seven and a half. Yeah. It's definitely very colorful, which we'll talk to more about the theme, but yeah, I'm, I'm probably right with you with a 7, uh, 7.5 because of the screen printing on all the different creatures. Nothing else is really outstanding. And we'll talk more when we get to theme because, but the board is big. It takes up a good chunk of your real estate on your table, but your player boards are small, which is nice. All right, now let's move on to theme. You're right. It does feel like Potoku in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. specifically the art style. It's gorgeous. Um, very colorful. <laughs> it is very colorful. I love it. Yeah. I, I love the colors. Um, for me, this is like definitely a color palette that I'm in love with. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is, is so you're essentially, you have a farm. You're trying to plant <laughs> and then put monsters in your farm to take care of it. It definitely reminds me of like Harvest Moon and some of those um, farm building on the game where you're, you have little spirits that help you do little different tasks, um, but you have to meet criteria, you, like you have to complete their quest kind of thing. Um, except there's no quest for them specifically in this one, but it's more if you have to get their placement right for them for you to get victory points. Um, so for that, that's what it reminds me as far as theme goes. I play those games, <laughs> I like yeah. that theme. Um, and I love the color palette. I'm probably gonna give it an eight um, because Although I love the color, love the art, love the color palette, kind of like the different things. It's not very strong in the game. Like the two connection, that well, one's kind of like... Yeah, I mean, you're going down tracks. It's, it is definitely a track movement game, and the, the tracks could be anything. I like the, the creatures. They're fun. They're, they're you know, clearly they, they've taken animals and kind of combined them. Like ants combined with something with antlers. Uh, you know, Scorpions with a plant yeah. and... Each of the players, they almost look like the uh, characters from the uh, that you would see in like the Among Us or whatever. They got the you know different create every character, every color has a different main character type, and they're fun. They're all cute. The board is very busy. 
but it doesn't really feel that busy when you're playing. It's Well, it feels busy when you first look at it. Yeah, it's intimidating. But when you get a hold of it, okay, it's fine. It's yeah. fine. Um, overall score? I think eight's fair. Yeah. All right, so moving on to the actual rule book. So, so the rule book's 24 pages in length. It does have that nice linen feel paper, upgraded paper quality. And that cover page that yeah, you like. The cover page yeah, matches the cover of the box. And then the, the contents and components, they do have pictures of them and counts of them. Now, one problem with the, the Kickstarter version is that the miss they have misprinted how many wooden cubes are supposed to be here because they've got enough for the base game but when you add the expansion it's supposed to have a wooden cube it doesn't have the wooden cube for that and they they said basically you could use the discs from the uh that you don't end up using because of the kickstarter upgrades which is fine but it's kind of a cop out when they, you know, they're it's supposed well, to. Well, honestly, that. they're cubes. We can go by cubes. Yeah, like, so I'm I think not... they kind of backpedaled and they're looking at doing something to replace them in the future. But it's not a big deal. Yeah, I mean, I'll probably end up going and pick them up. Pick them up if we end up playing this game a lot. So. As far as the rules, they are very lengthy for what this game really is. I mean, when you boil it down, it's not that hard, but it sure feels very hard when you're reading these rules. The setup is actually pretty simple, but the setup even looks complex on this. Now, the first time you get it out, there is a lot of building all of this stuff. So in that you know initial playthrough, it's going to take a while to set up. Uh, they go through and walk you through all the different steps of your turn. The biggest issue with the rule book is they've got cheat sheets and they got a reference on the back of the book. The reference for what you need to do on your turn is just like maybe a third of the page. They Which could have printed it on one side of this card, but instead two sides have the same thing on the cards. Uh, for the record, that was so lame because yeah. their order matters in the yes. game, in in your turn, and not to especially when you start because there's four different steps. So you got to make sure you do it right. And sometimes you don't do all of them yeah. because you don't need to do all of them um, because of what's going on. And so it's easy to screw up initially. Yeah. It should have been on these cards. There's it no reason. It should have been. Now, I will say they do have it on the board with a bunch of symbols. So if you don't know what those symbols mean. Yeah. Um, in fact, it wasn't until mid-second game we were all like, hey, I think that's what this portion of the board is. And it was like. Oh, yeah, you're right. That was not helpful at the beginning of the game at all. No. Um, so with that, I think it should have been on the back of this card. Yeah, it should have been. There's no reason that it, to have two sides of the same thing. And this is the end game scoring. It, which, which you is, still need it. Yeah, it's useful to have that. But the other thing is it doesn't have the expansion on it. So if you were playing the expansion, these cards are going to be useless anyway because the scoring for those is not on there. So really, if you know they're going to have these cards with the scoring, add the expansion scoring on it, and put the score the uh, the actual steps of the game on the other side. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I'll given the fact that you read through this, it takes you its actual gameplay ends uh, page twelve. So even though it's twenty four pages, it's only half of it. Then you go into the modules, the expansions. There's the Midnight River expansion. And then there's the uh, Winds of Change expansion, which are on here. And then there's so it overlays the different abilities of the Shaman, which is, you know, it's nice to have variability in the game, but, you know, that doesn't really require a whole page to say put these on there. Um, so, and then the solo mode. So a lot of this book is, you know, and then you've got the iconography. There is a lot of icons in this game, a lot of icons. And they're the not movie. all straightforward. No. And that is one thing, when you're doing icons, I feel like a lot of times they should be pretty self-explanatory with a little bit. Like, if you're accustomed to reading icons, okay. But there were a lot that it went a completely different direction than we anticipated. Yeah. Um, because, one, it had a symbol. And it wasn't that you got the symbol. You had to pay to do the act. Like, it was kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, this does not, I didn't, I would not have gotten that out of that symbol. Yeah. So I can't say this is a great rule book because it, it doesn't, you have to read through it. There's just a lot of minute rules. 
should have been summarized better on the cheat sheets. I don't think it's horribly bad, but it definitely could have been better. I'm going to go ahead and give it a seven, I think. Okay. So moving on to the gameplay, um, <clears throat> this game, I'll tell you right now, has a lot of small details. We're not going to go over all the <laughs> details. <laughs> Because we'd be here all day. Okay. Yeah, um, but in that aspect, that's kind of the, you know, with games like that, you just pay attention and hope for the best. All right. So I'm going to start out the game with three workers. Now, during the initial um, setup phase, everyone's going to put one of their workers. So um, on one of the tracks and move it up one. And it's in um, reverse turn order, so, so yeah, so Randy, I'm placing first. You're placing first. Now you first. get two of these larger ones and one of the smaller workers. You have two different styles. You have one with, that's printed in black and one printed in white, and they have different abilities. And then your oversized ones. So these the, will always have access. Yeah, the oversized, as soon as they come off the track, they come back to you, versus the smaller ones you actually have to retrain yeah. um, to get available to you. Um, so that's you know, example. So I'm going to go ahead and put, you know, there's a starting position on all the tracks for each one. And whenever you place it, you immediately move the track up. So Just I, this initial round. Yeah, then. so I'm gonna take it and I push it up one spot on the track, which makes room for the next person if they should choose the same track. Yeah, so me. if you have five players, you know, it's not that everyone's stuck, you know, whatever. Um, so I'll go up and increase my workers ready. All right, um, so then it'd be my first turn. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do, I can either place a worker or move one of the tracks up by one. Um, so if you're out of workers, it's not like you've completely wasted, you're trying to move forward. Um, we use that a lot more in two players. Mm -hmm. At four players, never use that. <laughs> <laughs> well, by the time your turn comes, you probably moved already. Yeah, we had so many falling off the board. Like, there was one time I had four workers coming off. Yeah. And, yeah, so anyway, um, four or five workers. It was it was, it was was a lot. Okay, all right, so for my turn, um, like I said, you can move one or take a thing, uh, place a worker. I'm going to end up placing a worker. Now, I can choose to spend favor to either place another worker or move up on the track. Now, I did find that I used paying favor in two player a lot more than I did at the four and five player. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that rule is very, very beneficial. And we did use it a little bit at the beginning of the second game with that many players because we were all trying to. Yeah, and favor is, a, is basically kind of a stat you have that you can pay goal negative in or positive, but it caps out on either end. And if at the end of the game, if you're not on the positive side, you're going to lose victory points. If you're on the positive side, you're going to gain victory points. So you don't have to worry about that so much until the end of the game. But during the game, it basically it gives you abilities to, to enhance your actions. Right. Um, so then if, so if, for an example, I decided to come off. Now, you can only come off the tracks when the track has moved. So, for example... When I first placed and I moved up one, I could have then decided to get off on that track. So we're going to say I did that for the sake of this demonstration. Okay. Um, it had to be at the time of the movement, right? You can't retro um, just so you can activate ability during your turn. It has to be upon movement. That is one of the, and I will say that is oftentimes instead of placing a worker, I moved a track was so I can get things off mm -hmm. so I can actually do something in the coming round. So then up to two workers, now I can spend favor for a third, but two workers can go down the tracks um, for free. So I'm gonna do that. So I'm gonna go down the track. I'm gonna just follow the symbols. This one gives me a worker, um, lets me train a worker. Uh, <clears throat> all right, let's write down there. And then I get um, one of the shaman abilities. If I had a uh, a, one of my cubes on that shaman, I do not, so I don't get any abilities. But if I were to, based on the number of gifts I have given that shaman, is the number of actions I get to take. They have to be different. So you can't do three of the same thing on there uh, because it's up to three. But you, they have to do differently. And then I get my worker back. Now, like I said, this is one of the bigger guys. So he goes straight to my ready-to-go pile. Um, if he was the smaller, he would have to go in the prep uh, portion of the game board. 
after that if I have the resources needed to complete my card I would complete the card at this time get the benefits at the top flip it over which gives me additional farming space that I could then use um, now the key thing there is well what if I got resources because all the resources are communal so just because you got re you know so if I were to get off a track that gave me resources for example all right and I didn't use them um, I would then take the bottom marker and match to the top and for every victory point I passed I would get those victory points which can be quite lucrative. Yeah, especially the bottom of the tracks, they are higher at the bottom. Now, I will say there is a strategy where all you do is get resources from other people. Um, and um, Sean took that to the full extent. When we played the second time, he midway switched to that um, play path because I, 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 when I talked to him, I had a game, I'm like, there's a way to do this. I just haven't got to play it yet. Um, he went for it and he broke the board. He maxed out at 396, and the most you can score in this game is 399. Um, well, so, the most you can score and be tracked on the board. Right. Yeah. So that tells you that he kind of, um, I did not get that much. <laughs> I didn't even get half that. Um, so that is pretty powerful, giving resources to other people um, because they end up using those resources to complete their stuff. But it's well balanced because um, a lot of times when you deal with communal resources, it feels like you're just making stuff for other people. But the victory points that are associated with it, I think, makes it even if not more powerful. Mm -hmm. Then just to keep in mind that you can go up these tracks. So depend, there are certain places if you place a worker on them, you go up the end of game scoring tracks um, and they change out every single game. Um, but as you go up, it increases your multiplier. Um, for those things. It made a huge impact on the field of the game. So the first time we went, it was all based on, um, I think it was, it was monster. About creatures, yeah. Yeah, it was about creatures, which made the creatures super powerful. But in the second game, that was like the least of the things. And so we had, Andrew strictly worked with creatures. Practically, that was his strategy to go for it. And he floundered. He didn't do well. But I know that if the bonuses we had previously yeah. were up there, he would have Oh yeah, because I, 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 I knocked it out of the park the first game because of the creatures, because I had them positioned. Because the creatures are, I, are really a cool concept here, because you get them, well first of all you have to supply them into the supply, then you have to take an action to claim them, and then you have to play them ultimately onto your farm, but they have to go on the vertices and they can't be adjacent to one another, so there's a lot of strategy. And their scoring is based upon the colors of the spaces that they're played on, so you have to arrange them, and some of them like to be in the same rows and columns as other creatures, but they can't be near each other still, so you've got to coordinate all that. And then there's also water, which is, acts as, as a multiplier for your score if they're on it. Now, the first time we played, we had a negative penalty, or we had ones where basically you got victory points for multiplier from this chart for being not on water. Right. Which was kind of... But it's maxed out. Yeah, so once you ma out. yeah, once you maxed out the total, because these are limited to eight points total times your multiplier, multiplier. of up to six. So you can get 48 points per one of those tracks, which is nice. But, uh, yeah, you are limited. So after you hit that max peak of eight, then you can play them on water and act. they act as a multiplier for your individual creature. Yeah, so there is that. that there is that. Um, overall, part of me wonders if some things were needlessly complicated with this game. Um, and the, I really did not like the fact of not having the cheat sheet because yeah. that made it more confusing for me. Um, I do like the fact that this got mixed up. I will note that whatever this said the game time was, it lied. <laughs> well, the first game, it was reasonable. Two players. Two players it okay? was. Okay, but once you start getting up to four and five, yeah. okay, I don't know if it was the people I played with because that is a possibility. Well, your we brother were at it. always. Well, no, but then we had, no, Adam's normally really fast, and I, no one waited on me that whole game, which is very odd, okay? So... <laughs> It it took a while. It was six six seven hours. Yeah. Rob and I learned Nova Roma, played Nova Roma, and we finished another game after 
that and that was also with punching and assembling and all of that and it we finished away before you ever guys did you yeah. guys even get to a halfway point yeah it was a long game which soured it a little bit for me not because uh, there's a couple of things i think it, some of it was needlessly complicated i think there are some things that i, I don't know if it was they're needed like and I, you can't I can't tell you exactly what to put. It's been a week since I've played. So some of those details, but I remember thinking, I think this is needlessly complicated. Um, I do think the turns shouldn't take too long, but for some reason they did. Um, and that turned out the game to be way too long and it kind of overstayed its welcome. And I don't know if it was because we played it with four or five players that maybe it gets that way. But I will say while you were taking your turn, it was more fun at four to five players because at that point your workers had actually moved along and you actually got to take actions every single time mm -hmm. that you got to play. But then that may be extended out the game. I don't think it was, I, I, I think it was an okay game. I think it, I think certain people would really like this game. I'm probably going to give this a seven and a half. I thought it was good. I think it may end up taking too long and that can really sour it at the higher counts but that was when it was your turn it was more fun to play at the higher counts yeah. so i'm kind of torn there yeah I mean, maybe you need a time limit on people's turn yeah. maybe get a little thing you got <laughs> well, three minutes i think minutes, that's baby. probably a good idea in general and particularly when you're playing with caleb or even me to some extent he wasn't the longest taker <laughs> well sean probably too you know because all of us have a tendency to try to figure out how to maximum the game and that it it invariably leads to some a lot of downtime. I think timers are going to have to go in yeah. session if I play. And it that also is going to people get. You know, the other thing is you can make this game a lot faster if by spawning creatures because every that's what drives the clock in this game, which is also interesting. It doesn't have a round timer. It's as you create creatures to get into the wild that every time a creature is added, that the clock moves. So you can actually drive it faster. The thing is, is it worth it? You know, and maybe that's where. If, if there was some recommendation would be to have some kind of tweaking as far as the victory points you get for spawning creatures. Cause there's really yeah. not a lot that you get for that. Well, that's the other thing in that, in the game with the four or five players, no one was spawning creature. Everyone was building up their board first. Yeah. And I can't disagree that that was the smart action because with the amount of victory points mm -hmm. that were on the board, you know, someone got the three, you know, three ninety something or whatever it was. Then you had Caleb at 200 and uh, a lot of points. And then, <laughs> and then you had us two at the late 190 something. I mean, there were a lot of points yeah. to be had. Um, but my concern is, like you said, there's not a distinct timer. If I had known that's what I was getting into, I would have spawned a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and maybe that's what you, it's, you know, you need to make sure that so many of these bonus tokens are based upon creatures because in a scenario where you get none of them tied to the creatures, but based upon maxing tracks and all of this kind of thing, you're going to end up with, you know, stagnation, I think. So, and maybe that's the inherent flaw with using that system, but I did like it because it was novel. It's not something you see, but you typically, you play so many rounds around the table and that's it. But I think the opposite could also be true is that the creatures will spawn so fast that you don't have much. Well, you got to have enough game. space for them. I mean, you can only put them up there about three at a time. Right. So, you know, I, I think that it's interesting concept. Maybe it's flawed as far as design. Because there's not there's situations you can get into that it's not worth the points to do it because it's really all it does is drive a few points or it may add some additional spirit to you, but it's not nearly it's not nearly as powerful as getting points from down here yeah. or, the, or the tracks. So, for example, that game, I the fourth game, I had two creatures until my last turn. And due to the way I played it, I ended up picking up another six creatures and laying them down. Because you can do that if you, you know, get the right things and do the right bits. And so, you know, I let other people, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know. It was, I don't know, something's, something's janky about it. It shouldn't have, no way should have taken six plus hours. Yeah. That was messed <laughs>
<laughs> we were like, please hit this. Yeah, it was our New Year's, and there were people who came, and they were just burnt out after this game and, and left before left. New Year's. And I felt bad because the new group had come in, and they're like, did they not like me? I had to, Everyone left, and we were like, no, it was this game. <laughs> we played it. It was way too long. So just keep that in mind when you guys play it. I said a seven and a half. What is your score? You know, I didn't suffer through that. I, I see. I can. I think that that could become a painful. It was painful. It, the first game we played, I really liked it, uh, and I liked the scoring system and the uniqueness of it. I'm probably going to go ahead and give it an eight until I get that bias. But you know, I can see where that could happen, and. The concern, you know, is like I said, I think that you need to make sure that there's the creatures that drive the timer have some value to them. And I, th I think that it would have been nice if they enforced that somehow, uh, as opposed to the tokens being so overly powered compared to that, that it, you know, causes people not to want to drive the timer. Yeah. Well, here's the, here's the aspect of it is kind of the top of the, so you got eight tracks but four you got four conveyor belts that you send your workers on and you can go to the top or to the bottom the only where you generate creatures are this bottom tier except for one you can sometimes do one the fifth one but the top here is about all develop board development or getting your workers or getting cards and so you could spend your initial part of the game all up here mm -hmm. And that's where it gets kind of, I think people can get stuck up there and not come down. I think maybe they should have maybe thrown a develop, you know, a creature up top or something to kind of yeah. force the game to move Well, forward. I mean, the, the one track is all about getting the creatures that have been put out. So if you go up that and no creatures are out, it's a waste too. So that track is kind of dead too. You know, if if you're not spawning creatures, you're really down to three tracks, and I would I, I wouldn't want to play a game where I'm only using three of the eight tracks. So ah, but they're good bouncing tracks. <laughs> so well, no, because you end up getting gifts, and you put gifts down here. Oh, I know. And then, like, I, I'm sorry, I did that. I did that. I used the wild resource to finish a little bit of cards mm -hmm. I had, and I was going. But then as soon as Sean switched his strategy to just giving everybody resources, which ended up triggering the game finally, was to generate, and everyone was using his resources, that's why he went telling, you know, so there is something to be said about generating these things, specifically getting the resources while doing it. So, I don't know. There may be some different ways to play depending on how these are up. So it'll yeah. be interesting to see how that flies. Um Anyway, well, thank you guys so much for joining us. We had an absolute blast, and hopefully you'll come hang out once again. We'll catch you guys later. Bye. Bye.